Dr. Cherry Kubota, um, she's a professor at the Department of Horticulture and Crop Sciences and the director of the Ohio Controlled Environmental Agriculture Center at the Ohio State University. Uh, Dr. Kubota received her PhD in horticultural engineering and a MS in horticultural sciences from uh, Chiba University in Japan. And uh, after that, she worked as a faculty member at Chiba University for six years. And then she um, moved to the United States where she was in the School of Plant Sciences for 16 years. And uh, um, uh, unfortunately for the University of Arizona, she, but, but great for her, um, she ended up moving to Ohio State University in, in 2017. Um, uh, Dr. Kubota is the is a research division vice president uh, and a fellow of the American Society of Horticultural Sciences. And um, I think with that, I will uh, I will end. I just say she's a, a great collaborator and um, very fun to work with. So, um, we're, Jerry, we're we're looking forward to your to your talk. Great. Great. Thank you very much, Rod. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm connecting from Columbus, Ohio, uh, which is like a center of state of Ohio. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about my research, um, but I, I, I can tell you I do many different things. So it's gonna be a flavor of my type of research. So I don't really concentrate into a area. I do this, that, that. Um, pretty much responding to uh, um, our stakeholders need. All right, so, um, so yeah, so the controlled environment agriculture is my um, technology area I'm working on. So the crop species include like tomato, um, pepper, strawberry, leafy greens and young seedlings and you know, all kinds of crops. Um, what I do is um, basically using a, a basic understanding of physiology and then introducing an engineering approach to make something innovative um, in applications. So that's what I do. All right, so if you're not familiar with US CEA status, I, I, I like to um, uh, include that um, so that it, it would be helpful. So U.S. has probably 11th, 10th or 11th largest um, greenhouse uh, area, but most of the area is still uh, ornamental floriculture uh, greenhouses. Food crop it's probably increased quite a bit uh, over the past 10, 20 years, but still probably 10% 10, 10 or so. So the 90% ornamental floriculture um, propagation materials. Um, so within that 10% or so, uh, tomato is the major crop. Used to be probably close to 70% tomato out of US food crop greenhouse. Now it is like a 60% or 50%, as you can see in this slide. And then uh, leafy greens, other crops, um, berries are increasing quite a bit over the past uh, five to 10 years. So I mean, in that minority, but um, we, we think that this is very important technology to make the food crop production more sustainable. Why we didn't use greenhouse before? Because we have California and Florida, and then they can take turns to produce uh, fresh vegetable and fruits year round. But as you know, there are tons of issues in open field. So therefore uh, greenhouses are now more and more um, uh, utilized, uh, not like a centralized production, but more uh, distributed production uh, for local consumption. So why I'm in Ohio. So Ohio, one of the reason is um, Ohio is a fast growing state in terms of CEA, controlled environment agriculture. As you can see, the left hand side, this is a number of states I show, um, including Arizona. Those are the top running states in terms of food crop production under controlled environment. Compared to those, the increase of acreage in greenhouse for food crop production in Ohio is uh, close to three times over the uh, uh, five years or six years or so during this time period. 
um, that is coming from a large increase in greenhouse tomato industry. And then um, uh, you can see that greenhouse tomato uh, during those years, uh, uh, more than five times increase. Those greenhouses are originally from Canada. And then Canada um, traditionally focus on summer production, not so much in winter production. And then they decided to come to Ohio to do winter forecast production. So that's the current trend going on in, in um, Ohio. So greenhouse um, requires many different expertise. Um, so I just listed um, six different expertise um, you, you might want to acquire um, to function in greenhouse operation and then also research. My lab is contributing those two areas mainly, so the plant physiology, whole plant physiology, and then engineering uh, because of my sort of uh, interdisciplinary background, um, educational background. And then um, um, I can collaborate and then mainly collaborate uh, 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 with uh, other people to, um, to work on those areas. So try to make the impact in controlled environment is my mission. So what we do, um, uh, well, so the goal is uh, making CEA more sustainable and productive or profitable. And then what we do, um, uh, number one is that we are trying to improve the crop quality, produce quality by controlled environment. Um, and then I'd like to show some example in that line of research. And then we are trying to introduce more crops in, in controlled environment. Uh, tomato has been the um, major player or the major crop um, in a controlled environment. What about other crops? So I uh, wanted to introduce because tomato is uh, very competitive. Fresh tomato is a very competitive market because we have Mexico producing a lot of tomatoes in controlled environment and then exporting to US. Um, and then I also work on um, uh, interface area. So connecting controlled environment with open field production in the form of high quality transplants. And then that's a long term study. I, I probably started doing that um, back in Japan, um, graduate uh, school, um, but this is still a very important area of my research. And then I, I show you some example too. And then more recently, uh, because of the industry moving into indoor production, indoor in this case, um, sunless, you know, without sunlight uh, controlled environment, fully controlled environment, um, and then how we can optimize the environment and how we can make the new industry more sustainable. And then I like to add a, a quite interesting um, uh, research in terms of light management uh, today uh, to introduce. I have worked on many projects um, in uh, uh, lighting uh, management, so the LED lighting or natural lighting. Um, light quality, so so that's I thought would be interesting. So um, okay, so the uh, producing high quality crop um, in terms of flavor, uh, nutritional quality, or um, eating eating quality or consistency. So I worked on um, several factors such as salt, salt stress, uh, light quality, and temperature. And then I, I am going to introduce my work dealing with salt stress, sort of strategic use of salinity for improving flavor of um, greenhouse crop. So the work initiated by a collaboration with a company called Nature Suite. Uh, it's a Mexico-based US company. And then they wanted to um, know how consistent we can achieve um, in terms of uh, uh, sweetness of the cherry tomato um, by adding uh, sodium chloride in the nutrient solution of uh, soilless production. So they use coconut core um, as a substrate and then drip irrigation, and then uh, providing a nutrient solution, having a more sodium chloride so that uh, uh, electrical conductivity or the osmotic potential is higher or more negative. And then, so the result is a much better flavor. So this is our um, very early study demonstrating that we can maintain the high um, bricks. Bricks is a sort of indication of 
sugar content or I would say uh, nutrient or flavor density. And then you can see that um, one degree or so constantly greater than conventional um, uh, cherry tomato. And then we apply to uh, uh, larger fruits. And then this is uh, what we call TOV, tomato on vine. So it's like a 100 to 150 grams uh, in size. And then you can see that um, the bricks is uh, about uh, two degrees higher than the a normal tomato um, in that large one um, compared to cherry. But what we found in the uh, um, TOV type tomato was um, the color was uh, denser, you know, the um, strong, stronger color in, in terms of red. So as you can see, actually in the picture, the conventional tomato has kind of um, weak color development um, compared to uh, 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 high EC or high salt, uh, salt stress tomato. Um, so that both tomato from outside, you can't see the difference, but if you cut into half, you can see the difference. So that is actually lycopene. So the lycopene is the red pigment or orange pigment in tomato, and that is good for uh, human health. So we wanted to make sure that is coming from a salt stress. Um, and then we did a, a more in-depth research. Basically students went out to uh, mark the flowers and then track down the lycopene development under salt stress uh, and then also a conventional stress level. Our salt stress is, uh, in, in terms of EC, if you're familiar with hydroponics, it, it's not that high, 4.8, it's not that high. So um, if you just look at the plants, you can't tell which one is high EC plants and then which one is standard EC. It, it's, it's a mild stress. Um, and then you can see that under high EC, lycopene develop um, uh, faster and then uh, at, at the ending up uh, at the greater extent or the concentration, uh, both for fresh mass space and dry mass space, um, it, the increase is about 40% of the conventional. So that's, that's quite interesting. And then we wanted to test that, um, how this can, uh, be consistent over the season and what factors affecting lycopene and then what factors affecting uh, bricks, for example. So the following study, which was um, based, based on that previous um, understanding of uh, high EC and high lycopene um, enhancement, um, so you can see that um, we did, uh, this is uh, about one year data, but we did one and a half year or nearly two years of study. And then it just extracted one year amount of data here. Um, you can see this greenhouse um, data, um, Arizona, we have a uh, uh, peak of the light intensity. We use DRI, that's a daily light amount of usable for photosynthetic um, activities. So um, daily amount of photosynthetic light is peak uh, around June, but temperature peak is about you know August. Uh, why? Because we have monsoon season, so a little bit more humidity. So uh, even though the light is declining, um, the hum uh, temperature is high. So that created unique opportunities to see um, which parameters are highly correlated with lycopene, concentration or sugar um, or the flavor density. So um, lycopene was consistently higher under the high EC. And then um, it, it is more correlated with temperature. Um, and then research also showed that uh, lycopene has a specific uh, optimum temperature range for development or the synthesis. Um, in terms of uh, uh, bricks or um, flavor density, it's more correlated with um, light intensity. And then that makes sense because uh, um, increase of uh, flavor density is more coming from water relation. So basically limiting water going into fruit, uh, only three or uh, three to five percent of total water content in the fruit um, reduced by high EC because of the um, um, higher um, osmotic uh, pressure in the uh, root zone. So that's why uh, it's water related. And then uh, um, uh, light is the one of the big uh, factors affecting transpiration. So the, creating a more negative xylem 
um, pressure, therefore reduce the water going into the fruit. So that's that's some of the research we did for the in terms of um, tomato and the haisi. We also tested this um, idea to other crops. I collaborated with Yuma scientist um, uh, Jorge Fonseca. Um, he and his postdoc wanted to test uh, this concept to uh, leafy greens and then um, evaluated the response of um, lettuce um, to different concentrations of sodium chloride. And then as you can see, a very small amount of um, sodium chloride um, uh, didn't reduce the growth because plants can tolerate that, but increased the beta carotene concentration 80%. So that's quite interesting. We also did in my lab or in my greenhouse in Tucson, um, uh, different uh, cultivar of lettuce, which was a red variety and an increased anthocyanin um, about 30% by a uh, little bit higher um, sodium chloride concentration. So sodium chloride is really interesting, particularly if you are recirculating, um, that's, that's probably um, easy to manage um, at certain level. Um, but uh, for the um, leafy green application, one thing I liked, but not may, may not be everyone's uh, pre, uh, preference was, um, Actually, it adds salty flavor to your leafy greens. Um, but you know, when you are eating uh, leafy greens for salad, you would probably add um, salty stuff in in you know dressing and salt and um, you know so that it, it, I thought it was a quite unique uh, characteristic we can add, but may not be so much common thing uh, appreciated. So it was an interesting research, but probably not so much applicable. Um, so the next topic I'd like to um, introduce is uh, introducing new crops. And then we did a lot of different crops. We, um, I just showed sort of some of them, but we, we tested many more than this. Um, and then among those, something we were, um, you know, um, uh, putting more effort over the past let's say 10 years, it's strawberry. So the strawberry research, I started in Arizona to 2009, just thinking, you know, strawberry has been grown in controlled environment in other countries and US almost none. Um, so we started uh, back then and then realized that strawberry is kind of unique um, in terms of physiology and difficult to learn how to grow successfully. So, um, just try to solve the issue, one issue after another, and then we still work on that. Um, particularly after um, moving to Ohio, uh, our focus is how to reduce the cost of lighting and uh, um, heating, so the temperature control. Because strawberry, greenhouse strawberry production, um, usually off season, so starting in November, or maybe October, so that before the holiday season starts, and then all the way to probably May or June when temperature is no longer uh, good for food, uh, fruit quality. So it's it's off season, um, late autumn, winter, early spring production. And then Ohio, it's such a dark <laughs> winter state. So uh, lighting cost is obviously um, important uh, part of the cost, overall cost, and then also the heating. So um, currently um, we are working on different um, uh, cropping systems, uh, but before going that one, um, I just realized I have a few more slides I wanted to show regarding strawberry. So when we started strawberry production, one of the challenges we encounter uh, during the first year, so the 2009, was a tip on issue. This is a abiotic environmental disorder. Um, this is a calcium deficiency, but not because calcium doesn't exist in a nutrient solution. Even there are tons of calcium in nutrient solution, you get this issue. Arizona, obviously, it's just too dry. Dry condition cause this. Um, so the tip and usually start in a growing shoot tip, because the growth rate of the shoot tip is too fast relative to the supply of calcium coming from transpiration. Um, 
So you, you see very dark color of new leaves coming up and that end up with this twisted leaf and then dead tissue at the edge of the leaf. This may be acceptable because 90% of leaf are still functional. Um, however, something like this, cadix band, which is also calcium deficiency, this is not acceptable because uh, market doesn't accept that, you know, the brown dead leaves attached fruit. Um, so one of the mechanism uh, plant has is a gutation and a gutation for strawberry is more like a, a indicator for health. When you can see gutation once in a while in your a strawberry crop, uh, that means strawberry plants are happy. Um, you can see that in coastal California, strawberry field early in the morning. So it's a lot of, you know, um, water droplets um, along the uh, edge of the leaf. This is coming from hydrosol and then water is not condensation. It is coming from inside of the plant, xylem flux. So it's containing calcium and all that, uh, 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 you know, elements transported through xylem. And then calcium is one of them. So when gutation is happening, you can see that shoot tip is also having gutation. Um, so that means calcium is provided to the fast growing uh, shoot tip. Um, and then in that situation, you never see tip bump. So we started thinking about the conditions to induce gutation and then usually during the night when you know, no light is um, uh, in an in a environment. So therefore, stomates are totally closed. And then if you have a high humidity, then you have a um, then you have a, a almost um, a no transpiration from the plants, uh, not from the stomates, and then also not from the non-stomatal surface. So you can completely shut down, you know, the transpiration, and then water still want to come 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 from the roots, and then pressurizing xylem, and that's why you see gutation. And then that's again, um, a very important function to provide calcium to the uh, shoot tip. Arizona, it's, it's been dry day and night. So that's why uh, gutation never happened in Arizona. And then Ohio also dry because we are heavily heating greenhouse and then you know the leaky greenhouse uh, let the um, uh, air exchange so that uh, humidity level in Ohio also uh, very low. So you get massive amount of tip bound without doing anything. Um, so, so again, we wanted to uh, do, a, 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 we, we wanted to achieve the uh, conditions that would induce gutation. So that uh, idea is um, reducing um, tip bound. So this is a proof of concept research. As you can see, um, someone came in the greenhouse early morning and then uh, the beginning of the night every day cover and uncover so that nighttime is maintained very high humidity. So um, if you do that, uh, you can see gutation, massive amount of gutation, again, because the humidity is so high inside the uh, uh, cover. And then we could demonstrate that with high humidity uh, uh, treatment at night. Um, tip band is reduced and then also calyx band is um, largely reduced compared to the conventional uncovered condition. So it was good, but um, it's not really practical because um, growers would never do covering uncovering every day. Um, so we tested many things and then um, ended up with this idea of under bench misting with blower to uh, circulate the air so that enhancing evaporation. So, and then also uniquely, uh, it's only three hours we, we, we should get above 95% humidity so that gutation can happen. And then um, rest of the time, you can let the humidity goes down naturally um, so that you can prevent fungal disease uh, because you don't wanna maintain that high humidity long time. Uh, and then also another thing is um, you don't you don't need to do every night. You can do only two three nights per week. Uh, for most of the cultivars we tested, only one or two cultivars they are just so sensitive to tip on, and then we needed to do almost every night, but only three hours to get ninety five. 
So that's quite um, uh, effective technology development. Um, without achieving that um, technology, uh, we probably stop working on strawberry because uh, we might have concluded that strawberry is not so, you know, a uh, good crop because of the tip ban. So yeah, so now we are working on different um, production systems um, or uh, cropping systems. Uh, one is the uh, European double cropping system, which is um, developed based on the high um, energy cost and then also lighting cost. So what they do in Belgium and Netherlands, they have a big fall production and then they have a winter resting time, December and end of December to January. And then and then the uh, plants are in the greenhouse, but greenhouse temperature is almost the minimum. So just avoiding uh, uh, freezing damage, um, but accumulating chilling hours so that plants get um, dormancy and then um, uh, coming out from dormancy with that. And then with that uh, winter rest, uh, spring crop is um, anecdotally much, much higher than normal crop, continuous crop. So that's why it's being widely practiced in Belgium and Netherlands. So we wanted to test that idea or practice in Ohio, because again, we, we wanted to see if that is uh, making sense to reduce the cost, um, even though January is actually high market season or high price season in the market. So missing that, is it make sense or not? So we are comparing two cropping systems, uh, continuous harvest and production, you know, throughout the uh, autumn and uh, uh, early spring um, up to the beginning of summer um, and uh, double European standard double cropping system. And my graduate student, Ohio State is looking at growth and development, plant morphology, flower development, um, and then yield and fruit quality, and then heating, lighting costs. So it's ongoing study this year. And then um, this is a, my outreach, but um, whenever I develop knowledge, new knowledge, practical knowledge, most of the case, I wanted to share. Um, I think knowledge and information should be uh, um, readily available, free to access, uh, but wisdom and maybe uh, uh, more intellectual information should be for, you know, fee. But so I, I developed uh, many, many um, uh, websites. Um, and then this is one of the websites I have. And then this is for strawberry. So all the information related, still some of the pages under development, but most of the pages are ready. Um, so if you are interested in strawberry, this is the site you wanna go. Arizona, I think they still keep my old website, but those are outdated. Um, this is more updated information. All right, so, um, I would like to talk about uh, transplant production technology. As I said, I see transplant production is an interface technology area connecting controlled environment with uh, open field production. High quality transplant is so important in crop production and then controlled environment can achieve that high quality consistently. So that's, that's very important. And this is my early um, uh, uh, involvement in this type of project uh, back in Chiba. Um, we did uh, indoor production technology development. That was late 90s. And then we were growing transplants under fluorescent lamps and then planted out in the greenhouse. This is the ornamental plants, but you can see the quality difference of the um, uh, uh, pansy. And then, um, you know, the pansy is a winter crop, you know, you, because they have a really good tolerance in the cold temperature. So you are planting in the fall and then uh, flowers in mild area like Tokyo, um, they, they go flowering, you know, almost all through the winter time. Um, but seedling production, transplant production has to be in mid summer. And that is so challenging in greenhouse industry. So the seedling quality is not really good because temperature goes 40 degrees. Um, during summertime in greenhouse. So instead of that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, using an indoor system, maintain temperature perfect. Um, so the 20 degrees C. And then um, 
perfect DRI and then producing strong seedlings and then plant it out in the fall. And then you can see that um, um, much more uniform growth and then also advanced flowering. So that's really um, interesting application of controlled environment, seed, seedling production. This is another um, um, project we did in Chiba. Um, this is a, a spinach um, uh, transplant production. So the spinach is also another crop difficult to grow in summertime. So growers either uh, change the cultivars or just don't grow spinach in summer because it, it you know, under long day uh, and then also uh, high temperature, spinach tend to bolt, bolting meaning flowering. You don't wanna get flowers. You wanna you want get leaves and stem for spinach. So what we did was compared to greenhouse summertime production of the seed rings, only 14 days um, from seed to transplanting, um, greenhouse tend to be long day and uh, uh, warm temperature, therefore 86% of the cultivar bolt, bolt, um, um, bolt in the uh, um, greenhouse. However, if you grow seed rings 14 days in indoor production condition, nice temperature, short day, then they don't bolt even after transplanted in a greenhouse. So that is basically delaying bolting because the uh, early stage plants are not subject to warm temperature long day. So that was quite unique um, uh, strategy to produce um, crop that is not possible otherwise. Um, we ap apply that same understanding, same approach to um, lettuce production in Yuma because in Yuma, Arizona, um, their production season starts um, in the fall. And then um, uh, that during winter time, it's basically the main area of producing leafy greens to the US market. And sometimes but of, often beyond the US, like Canada um, is also uh, consuming leafy greens uh, coming from uh, Yuma, Arizona. So their challenge is how can they put the production a little bit earlier than usual? So the earliest they can plan is probably September, um, but they wanted to do uh, August planting. But when you do August planting, the typical issue is bolting. And as you can see, um, iceberg lettuce having a very elongated stem, and this is not good. This is awful taste because of the, uh, bitter compound um, uh, develop in lettuce. And then it's just ugly and then just not marketable. But if you grow seedlings in controlled environment up to um, uh, uh, nearly four weeks or so, um, and then very strong plants survive really well, and then uh, uh, reduce the incidence of bolting. So that was quite unique, um, but I had to leave um, Arizona. So I, I didn't have an opportunity to continue working on this project. That's something, you know, as a drawback moving from one place to other. All right, um, another long term project I worked, probably this one was from 2005 uh, and then onward. Uh, um, so we are working on almost like a 15 years vegetable grafting. I don't know how many of you are familiar with vegetable grafting, but that's an old technology uh, developed in, in Japan um, and then transplant, uh, uh, transferred to many other countries um, to combat against soybean disease. So um, something like watermelon, right, um, uh, can graft on squash rootstock uh, to, uh, to, be, um, to be able to grow in a, uh, Fusarium infested soil. Fusarium is notorious in watermelon. And then uh, breeding cannot introduce Fusarium resistance to watermelon. Many people try to do that. I'm not a, a, a breeding person, but I have heard that um, whenever introducing Fusarium resistance to watermelon, the flavor is going to be affected. Therefore, it, it's not marketable. So grafting was an alternative way to achieve that resistance. And then because of that reason, um, some of the countries like Japan, Korea, Turkey, Greece, um, uh, Southern Spain, 90% of watermelon plants are all grafted. 
So it's it's well utilized technology, but US was slow in terms of introducing this technology to US. Um, uh, but uh, the greenhouse tomato um, uh, producers were um, using this grafted transplant technology because they can get um, higher yield. So when we started the um, vegetable production, uh, vegetable grafting project in back in 2005, six, um, that time period, there were no grafting capacity in the US. Um, and then yet greenhouses are using grafted plants. So where the greenhouse grafted plants um, were coming from, that came from the, those um, uh, Canadian um, uh, nurseries, propagators. But now we did this uh, survey um, last year, and now uh, we see more uh, uh, nurseries um, uh, developed in the US because of the um, increasing interest from open field, not just greenhouse, but open field uh, 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 watermelon growers as well as tomato growers. Therefore, we have now sizable um, nurseries exist in um, US, but still it's very small number. So um, plants are basically traveling still a lot. So, so, so this one is particularly a large um, nursery specialized in watermelon grafting. And those plants travel to you know, many different locations in the US. So sometimes four to five days in a, a temperature co controlled um, or non-temperature controlled sometimes uh, trailers. So it's very unique situation. And then as a total um, number of grafting, uh, we now producing uh, nearly 60 million plants. And then uh, used to be old tomato, but now 24% or 25% watermelon. So it's a very much dynamically changing area. But we still, you know, import plants from Canada too, particularly for uh, tomato grafted plants. So one of the issues, something like that, you know, small nursery, I mean, small number of nurseries uh, distributed in US and then serving um, uh, growers in, in, in the distance, um, plants need to travel many days. So this is a short, short uh, shipping from North Carolina to um, Columbus, Ohio. We put that temperature sensor and then show that temperature goes down. It's, it's a middle of winter. It's, it's um, um, from uh, January 29 to uh, uh, January or the February 1st. So you can see that um, three, four hours of um, uh, very low temperature, close to three degrees C uh, was in this shipment. And plants could tolerate, this is tomato plants, but sometimes, you know, the, if the um, uh, shipment needs to be um, stopped in the middle of the um, route, um, or, you know, you can, you can expect four or five days of transportation longest. In that case, uh, plants may get um, much longer um, chilling stress. And then tomatoes are relatively low temperature tolerant. Um, most sensitive crop um, among those grafted widely is uh, watermelon. So my graduate student here worked on uh, um, temperature stress, acute low temperature stress, uh, and then plant response to that stress using watermelon grafted plants. So multiple things we found in this study was, uh, first of all, freezing point of watermelon seedlings that was between minus three and minus two. So you, you can't get down temperature below that. <clears throat> and then um, we also found that it's likely um, that there, there likely be a threshold temperature that sh um, should consider when you look at the temperature profile during the transpiration, uh, transportation. So that um, uh, temperature threshold is four degrees C. Whenever you have lower than four degrees C, you have to count how many degrees below four degree um, threshold and how many hours of that low temperature um, uh, were in that um, shipping. 
So we, we found that um, about 50 units, um, you know, that's a sort of threshold to cause a developmental delay. Um, visual quality damage is, may not be so much a problem, but developmental delay, which is also coming from low temperature stress, uh, that is something uh, growers and nurseries need to avoid. And then his um, research, my master degree student, um, show that uh, there is a threshold in terms of degree hours of that temperature below four degrees C. So I think that's quite interesting. Hopefully we can continue this project um, with a new um, grant uh, we are trying to achieve. So um, indoor farming, um, this is new project in, in my um, lab. Um, so my graduate student is working on um, two things. One is um, um, uh, a tip pan management. So it's, I talked about the strawberry tip pan, but lettuce is also notorious in terms of tip pan and how we can assess the risk of tip pan based on the microclimate assessment um, so that we can assess the likelihood of transpiration and then also uh, growth rate. So we are working on this and hopefully I, I get more um, interesting result to share in the future. Um, another area I'm working on that um, indoor production system, although this can be applic applicable to a, a, a greenhouse, but we are trying to do a unique way to mitigate the soil, uh, not soil bone, a water bone disease in hydroponics. Um, so hydroponics, um, it's clean, but once you get a, a fungal disease in a, a, or the omycid disease in a root zone or nutrient solution, it's so difficult. You have to either um, clean entirely by stopping production or adding some kind of agent, um, although it would typically reduce the growth uh, of the plants. So, and then those are very expensive um, uh, compounds. So we wanted to do something very unique and something very cheap. So, so we came up with this idea of low pH. Um, pH is um, you know, typically maintained at um, optimum 5.5 to 6.5. And then growers don't want to go lower than 5.5 or higher than 6.5. But lower pH potentially reduce the omycete, you know, the uh, disease, uh, waterborne disease, like a PCM or a Phytophthora. Um, so we wanted to do if plants can tolerate low pH, and if not, can we mitigate that? Um, uh, how do I say? Uh, can we reduce the growth uh, impact of the growth under low pH? Because we know that low pH is not. Um, not always a direct effect, it's more indir indirect effect. So the reduced nutrient availability and therefore growth reduction happens. So if we can modify the nutrient solution, plants can probably sustain the yield and then grow in a low pH and then a fungal disease or a omycete disease um, can be um, prevented. So we are working on spinach and then basil and then basil is quite unique because they, they can they can grow even in a pH 4.0, no reduction of um, yield. So we decided to use this to um, uh, demonstrate the concept, low pH approach, acidic nutrient solution approach. So we have a 4.0, plants are fine, um, and then inoculated with PCM, non-inoculated PCM. And then 4.0 inoculated um, condition, you know, the roots didn't get infected, so didn't show the root rot disease versus conventional 5.5. Um, if you inoculate the nutrient solution with PCM, um, uh, you see that um, root rot disease happening. So I thought this is quite interesting. And then my new graduate student working to test many different crops, not just spinach and basil, and then try to develop a new uh, nutrient recipe so that plants can tolerate um, relatively low pH conditions. So that's a new project we are working on. All right, and then so for indoor ag um, area, we, um, uh, uh, we, we have this website with uh, Michigan State and Purdue uh, collaboration. And then my, uh, I have been doing this uh, probably two years or so uh, webinar series monthly 
um, as my extension effort, um, having speakers from industry and academia, and then uh, try to create a, a community and forum so that um, you know we can uh, com we can exchange information and and then uh, uh, show something um, they need to learn. So that's that's quite well you know attended um, uh, events I'm organizing for that area. So just quickly, um, it's it's getting close to the end. Um, so night management in CEA. Um, I want to introduce this project of a pink greenhouse. Um, it's a glazing technology we did in uh, uh, Arizona. So glazing is interesting. Um, uh, and then many companies, I, I, I bet, working on that. But this particular one was designed so that photosynthesis was enhanced. I think the idea is because uh, plant photosynthetic response is high in red. So instead of, um, uh, uh, you know, um, having a one-to-one um, -one or nearly one-to-one -one ratio of um, light qualities in blue and green and red, it just enhanced red might improve the uh, photosynthesis. So we have same, about same blue, um, but um, enhanced red, reduced green situation with this glazing. Um, material. And then we made sure that um, DRI or light intensity per day is about the same so that it's it's basically a comparison of light quality using greenhouse. Um, so yeah, so this, this McCree curve is showing high um, photosynthetic uh, efficiency in red. Um, and then, um, so that's why the company decided to use this. However, our research really didn't show the photosynthetic advantage. Um, red and uh, conventional light quality, it's about the same photosynthetic rate. And then we kind of knew that because uh, um, it's different um, for the leaf level and canopy level. Um, and then often we call photons are photons to drive photosynthesis. But uniquely, as you can see, um, uh, increase of yield um, uh, for two lettuce varieties when they are grown in a red rich environment. Um, so this is a fresh weight and dry weight and that's coming from the morphological improvement. Um, and then, um, however, when it gets to the mature stage, one cultivar didn't show anymore the advantage, but the other cultivar showing the enhancement um, by the um, quality uh, modified by glazing. So why the uh, cultivar difference happening? Um, it's, it's because of the way the leaves are growing in those cultivars. Um, Rex, which is a butterhead cultivar, tends to have um, curly leaf so that any enhancement of morphology or leaf area really didn't contribute to the yield um, increase uh, or the um, impact on the um, uh, yield increase was limited. But magenta, which is the other cultivar, which showed um, the um, increase of yield uh, all the way to the harvestable stage, that develop leaf more uh, flat and then sort of upright. And then that is contributing to that, um, the yield enhancement. So the cultivar is another factor. And then uh, whenever technology is developed, you have to also select the, the best cultivar to respond. So um, I guess that's probably, I should stop um, Rod, um, unless you have more time. We have, we have a couple more minutes if you if you uh... wrapping up. Yeah. Okay. So one thing I like to so so that's my research and in Ohio State is investing more and more for a, a controlled environment and then I like to show a two minute video um, to to show off we are developing a um, new facility for controlled environment which is a, a modern greenhouse. Um, Vendo style um, covered with uh, a very much advanced material ETFE and glass. Um, so I'd like to show that. So it's a virtual tour for you. Oh, I think I probably, hold on a second. I need to share again because the 
sound is not transmitted if I do this. Okay. Oh, hold on. We're reading your emails. <laughs> oh, you are reading email? No, 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 no. Just <laughs> your, your email box. Your email box came up. Okay. Screen one. All right. Right, and then. This research facility, currently named as Controlled Environment Food Production Research Complex, is the first of its kind in U.S. higher education. The Ohio State University has a strong and complete cohort of faculty expertise relevant to CEA or Controlled Environment Agriculture. This will be a great opportunity for collaborations innovations, and education for talented students through research activities. The facility will become a home of the Ohio Controlled Environment Agriculture Center, OSEAC, for various collaborations to respond to our stakeholders' need. One of the most exciting features of new greenhouse complex is that in addition to state-of-the-art research greenhouse spaces, there will be a large sections of greenhouse complex designed using controlled environment technologies relevant to our industry. This facility will support R&D for various technologies, for example, climate control strategies, new integrated pest and disease management strategies, irrigation, crop management, selecting or developing new greenhouse crops for human health, as well as advanced technology development, such as automation, remote sensing, and artificial intelligence. You can already tell how excited we are to be able to have this important facility for the College of Food, Agriculture, Environmental Sciences, and then also for the university. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity to introduce the facility to you. Okay. We're all jealous. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Cherry. Great talk. Very interesting work. Very um thank you, thank you. Uh very broad, uh ranging and uh exciting. So so let's um let's uh, open it up the floor to, to questions, please. When when will that be uh, when will that be uh um, finished that construction. Uh, so we, we are currently digging hole. Um, so <laughs> next year summer is a pro sort of expected time we can start using. So the 2022 oh. summer. Okay. Okay. One and a half years. Wow. Wow. That's exciting. Yes. Okay. We got, we got up to 93 people today. Cherry, that's pretty good. Wow. Yeah. Mark, uh, you have a question? Oh, yeah, hundreds. That's great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Cherry. <laughs> uh, look, I'll just restrain that because obviously I much prefer to keep quiet and let students ask questions. But I just ask um, at least one. Why did you choose ETFE for your new, I mean, it's great Teflon roof, but uh, I was interested to know why you chose that. Um, yes. Particular skin. Yeah. So ETFE because we wanted to grow field crop also in this greenhouse, and then uh, having a high transmission of UV yeah. as well as other um, um, spectral bands or the colors. I thought it's very important. So so that's why ETFE. And then this is a diffuse light diffuse type of ETFE. So combating um, direct light to diffuse and then um, broad spectrum um, transmission. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Can I ask one question? Yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> Actually, ma'am, you uh, very nice talk. Important thing uh, when we are uh, uh, 
proposing uh, i mean uh, we are going to control something then we it also have a cost so what is uh, my question is about cost of production when uh, you are going to control something then uh, it will definitely affect uh, cost yeah. of produce yeah so yes so you can grow cereal crops for example in controlled environment uh, you know if, if you are doing research that's fine like a phenotyping and stuff like that fine you want to use great greenhouse but for commercial production you the application is usually for high value crop and then usually fruits and vegetables um so because of the cost And where's the cutoff? Where's the cutoff? Yeah, yes. How do you define that? <laughs> well, the economic, when it becomes economically viable. Right, right, <laughs> right. So that's why when you, when you introduce, so the strawberry is also um, difficult one um, because mm -hmm. the price point is low coming from, you know, California. Yes. So it, it's difficult to um, uh, justify, but local growers wanted to shoot a little bit high price range so that they are more profitable rather than um, try to produce at the same uh, price target um, with California mass produced strawberries. Mm -hmm. hey, I ask a question. Yes. Thank you very much for great talk. Uh, when you observe the increase in lycopene content in fruits, did you see any change in photosynthetic tissues? Did, did you see effects on the growth of the, of the plant itself? Yeah, so that's so, only restricted to the fruit. Yeah, so the salt stress, we also look at the photosynthetic response. That level we are achieving um, EC 4.5 also in the drip um, didn't cause reduction of photosynthesis. So the growth itself was not, I would say not. Cause reduction. Uh, yeah, growth reduction was not there. Uh, yield reduction, yes, because we are basically reducing water and content. <laughs> so four or five percent of reduction. So that's that's something early, you know, early time growers did not want to accept because they don't want to even reduce 1% of yield. So it was challenging back then, but now um, greenhouse growers actually choosing low yielding varieties just because they get much higher price. Um, so it's, it's probably time to reintroduce this technology. Um, so basically the concept is taking ordinary variety and making extraordinary product. So. Yeah. Sounds very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You have Vanessa's <laughs> hand up. Bob. Okay, Vanessa. I don't, I don't see it, but uh, okay. Oh. <laughs> That's why I said, ahead, I, thought, I thought you couldn't, yeah. I see. <laughs> I wasn't taking it personally. Um, hi, Cherry, thank you for your talk. Um, so it's interesting how you try to control for waterborne pathogens um, by lowering the pH. Um, did you see any uh, micronutrient toxicity in, in the the leaves and yeah so, yeah. so how did you and how did you control the ph yeah. so i have a yeah i didn't explain too much but we saw yes so that we have this typical ph nutrient availability chart right and then we know low ph toxicity is the issue micronutrient toxicity but that's usually in the substrate situation we are doing a liquid hydroponic so that's nft dwc yeah. Micronutrients also not micronutrient deficiency is more the case, not toxicity. So the uptake goes down okay. um, when you go down pH. So both basil and spinach we did 
the uptake of nutrient, all nutrient, almost all nutrients goes down as pH decrease. So we are thinking increase is probably the, um, the way we should rather than decrease. We did decrease condition, it didn't affect. Um, so, so it was quite interesting. Um, uh, we, not many people report that because um, we don't have a specific chart for the liquid hydroponic situation. Yeah, I see. I see. And and how did you control the pH? And and did you consider mm. using adjusting nitrate and ammonium concentrations? No, we we just use acid. We use the sulfuric oh. acid ah, uh, yeah. mainly. Yeah, because that yeah. might be a, a more a less aggressive approach by yeah. altering yeah. those ratios. Yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah. when you have when you stabilize, so that when plants get stabilized, um, uniquely low pH, the pH, um fluctuation is much, much less because of the hydrogen, you know, high concentration of hydrogen ion is kind of creating a buffering situation. So it, it doesn't really go up and down as frequent as the conventional pH. Mm, I see. Mm. So I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Vanessa is asking questions right on the same line that was in my <laughs> Unsurprising, because you know, maybe if have you tried just giving them urea, for example, um, as a nitrogen source in hydroponics? I mean, I've never yeah. done that. To be honest. Yeah, yeah, it, it goes that yeah, so that instead of going up, stabilize. Yes. Yeah. Yes, or even going down. Yeah. 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 So we want to grow, mm. if possible, pH four point zero, um, or four point five. Mm so that um, the risk of pathogen is reduced. That's a really good idea. Mm. I love it. Mm. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so Cherry, I, I just want to uh, get your opinion on this. So, um, you know, we, we're, the, we're the center for desert agriculture. So we're trying to, um, uh, you know, think about how, how can we grow high value crops in this country, in Saudi Arabia. And the, the two big, the, the two main facts are is that it's hotter than hell, which is like Tucson, right? But there's no water. So um, what we're, what we, what we're dreaming about right now is kind of large scale controlled environmental um, agriculture in the country for uh, the locals to grow high value crops and then distribute them, you know, in, in urban centers and then distribute them. So this is not just lettuce and tomatoes. This is this would be, let's say, berries. This would be broccoli, you know, uh, green beans, so on and so forth. Um, what do you what do you do you think there's a future for something like that in a in a country like Saudi Arabia? Yeah. So so um, um, there's a company in South Australia. Um, that is using uh, saline water as a water source, um, actually seawater, and then desalinate with uh, solar power, and then create a fresh water, and then use that in a greenhouse. So it's a very impressive facility. Um, so that kind of approach, I think, applicable in Saudi Arabia, too. What about the other, what about uh, growing the other crops though? You know, I mean, again, do you think that's uh, viable? I mean, you know, it, like, you know, berries and... Berries, yes, but, um, but may not be, um, may not be like corn or maybe fresh um, sweet corn maybe, but um, not like a grain crop. No, no, not the grain crops, not at all. Yeah. We're, we're Vegeta thinking... most, most vegetables you can grow. Yeah, okay. Okay. So that yeah, because you know we're we're paying uh, you know we're we're getting uh, in in the cow's grocery store we get we get uh, blueberries from uh, Argentina. Oh my! <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I think it's like six bucks or something like that for just a little container of that. So it's. Oh it's, my! Uh, yeah, yeah, you can do much better. Yeah, control the environment. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah um, I'm just curious. I just wondered, you know, that this is kind of what we're 
thinking about. And, uh, you know, uh, so I just, you know, we, that's why we, we're, we kind of brought you on to, to give a, a seminar to teach us a little right. bit about greenhouses and things like that. So right. any other, uh, any other questions for, for Cherry? Yes, so I, I saw, have one. Okay, please. Uh, I, I don't know if I skip it, but I would like to know, you were mm -hmm. talking about controlling the pH to control the fungi in the roots mm -hmm. uh, with basil. Did you try it with the tomato? Because I was doing an experiment with tomatoes in like, uh, and we grew them until maturity and they were having a lot of uh, fungi diseases. Oh and yeah, know how to yeah. Control we, them. we haven't done in tomato. We, we, we are currently working on liquid culture. Um, so crops we are using is a liquid culture, typical crop. So the tomato usually in a soilless, right? Substrate um, culture with drip irrigation. And we, we, haven't, we haven't looked at that, but probably approach to mitigate the um, growth reduction at pH is totally different, but you know, as long as you can modify the nutrient solution to mitigate some of the issues, um, I think you can apply that to tomato also. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. But that's an interesting answer, Cherry. I mean, could you, I, do you think the control of the pH will be more difficult in these solar substrates that tomatoes are normally grown on? Or do you think that the low pH is not going to be effective. Yes, yeah. so, to, so tomato usually grow in a relatively small substrate volume. Yes. Yes. So compared to the what plants taken up, so it's only two liter or so per plant and then plant take yeah. up more than two liter sometime per day. Um, mm -hmm. In that situation, whatever you apply is dominating pH. So it's easy to control pH versus mm -hmm. like a strawberry. It grows relatively the same amount of substrate, but plant take up probably only 200 milliliter or 400 milliliter of water or nutrient contained, um, but only small amount per day. In that yeah. situation, substrate pH dominates. So even though you apply very low pH, controlling pH of strawberry, um, it's, it's, it's very challenging. So depending on the um, crop, but substrate, yes, definitely a disturbance in terms of pH control in some cases. But I think um, tomato, cucumber, relatively easy to, to manipulate the pH by applying uh, nutrient solution yeah. with low pH. But that makes Natalie's question really interesting, doesn't it? So mm -hmm. we might have a chance to try that. And so yeah, given these well, plants do have right. fungal problems, could that right. be a, a viable strategy to test? Right. And then what, oh. what, yeah. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sorry, just uh, related to this, which acid, ma'am, you suggest uh, to go to low pH? It will be phosphoric acid or hydrochloric acid. So we, we use sulfuric acid to reduce most. So it is not a toxic to plant. Right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any more questions for, for Cherry? It's a great. Uh, I think you got us pretty pretty excited. How much How much is that greenhouse complex costing you, Cherry? I think you said it's super expensive on the Ohio State campus, right? If it 30, was Thirty six million dollars. Thirty six million. Okay. <laughs> Just for ridiculous. Two, you for can... two thousand square meters. Oh gosh. <laughs> uh, so that you can you can probably build one tenth or less outside of campus. It's just so, it's crazy how they handle the project. Making costs oh, no. more expensive. 
need to grow a lot of tomatoes. I know. <laughs> but I look forward to seeing the gold-plated taps in your bathroom there. <laughs> I thought Kaus was bad. <laughs> well, it's on the it's on the university campus. So so uh, in terms of uh, to tomatoes, uh, Ohio is uh, a, a large, very large producer of tomatoes in, in the country. Right now, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, processing tomato is also here. Yeah. Um, well, of course, California is the number one state, but we have yeah. number five or some sort. Um, okay. okay. Oh, that's a field tomato. Okay. Okay, if there's no more questions, then uh, um, I think, um, Cherry, if you could hang on, uh, I think sure. uh, Mar Mark and I are going to have a chat, chat with you afterwards, and then uh, we'll uh, say goodbye to everybody. So uh, thanks again. Uh, so just hang on and just uh, everybody, one more applause here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.